Okay, so we start uh, Conceptual Physics, 11th edition, on Chapter 2, Newton's First Law of Motion and Inertia. So I want to start actually by talking about Aristotle's views on motion, which he came up with in the 3rd century BC. And basically, Aristotle uh, divided motion into two main classes, natural motion and violent motion. The idea with natural motion is that every object in the universe has some proper place determined by uh, what it's made out of, earth, uh, water, air, and fire being the four elements. So any object not in its proper place will strive to get there. For example, a lump of clay being from the earth will strive to get there and it'll go down. Whereas uh, a puff of smoke is made of air and so it will go upwards to try to, uh, to reach its natural place there. So earthly objects can either go straight up or straight down. And there was an idea that celestial objects had to move in perfect spheres. Another thing that Aristotle taught was that uh, heavier objects, since they're made of more stuff, should strive harder to get to where they're going. So the heavier an object, the faster it should fall. So beyond mo Earth, motion is circular. So the sun and the moon continually circle the Earth. This is all Aristotle's ideas, and they turn out not to be right, but they, they're interesting. Violent motion would be produced by external pushes and pulls on objects like the wind um, on a ship, or somebody shooting an arrow, or, or something that's not natural. So now we move way, 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 way forward to the 1500s, to Italy, and Galileo Galilei, who discovered that objects of different weight fall to the ground at the same time in the absence of air resistance. So there's a little... Uh, animation happening on this slide showing, I guess, Galileo up in the Leaning Tower of Pisa, uh, dropping uh, two objects that differ in their mass by a factor of 10, and yet they're falling at the same rate. <clears throat> Galileo also discovered something about inertia, and so he talked about forces being a push or a pull, and inertia being the property of matter to resist changes in motion. And this depended on the amount of matter in an object, or its mass. So this is the concept of inertial mass, which is very important. So something about inertia comes from balls rolling down, uh, down or up or along a planar surface. So Galileo discovered that if he rolled a ball down a little incline, it would speed up. So its velocity would start off slow, and then get faster and faster and faster as it rolled. However, if he took that same slope and tilted it upwards and rolled the ball up the hill, it slows down. So the speed starts off high and then gets slower and slower and slower. So Galileo reasoned correctly that if he had a horizontal plane and he started a ball with some initial velocity, that it should neither speed up nor slow down. So it just should have a constant velocity forever. And he reasoned, again correctly, that if the ball did come to rest on the horizontal plane, it's not due to its nature, but it's due to friction. So here we come to uh, Newton's first law of motion, published well after Galileo died in 1687, but basically saying exactly what Galileo discovered, which is that every object either continues in a state of rest or continues with a uniform speed in a straight line unless it's acted upon by a non-zero net force. So net force. Force is a vector. So a vector is a quantity whose description requires both a magnitude and a direction. And it can be represented by an arrow drawn to scale. The length of the arrow represents the magnitude and an arrowhead shows the direction. Force, velocity, acceleration, these are all vector quantities. So the net force is the vector sum of all the forces that are acting on an object. Example, if you pull a box with 10 newtons and a friend pulls oppositely with 5 newtons, and if you add those two vectors, 10 in one direction plus 5 newtons in the other direction, you end up with 5 newtons in the direction you're pulling. And that's the net force. Here's a block being pulled by two 5 newton forces in the same direction. 
and that force in this block is 10 newtons. And here is a block being pulled by two equal and opposite forces, which cancel, and then that force is zero. The equilibrium rule is about when, when the vector sum of forces acting on a non <coughs> uh, on an object equals zero. In this, in this case, the object is not accelerating. So basically it's this. The sum, or this Greek letter sigma, capital sigma, the sum of all the forces equals zero means that the object is not accelerating. Here's a platform uh, piece of wood, some guys walking on it. And there's tension force pulling up on it from these strings. There's the force of the guys pushing down on it. There's the weight of the whole bike itself. But if the sum of all the forces acting on this object is zero, then it won't accelerate. And that's the equilibrium rule. So another example, you have a bag of flour. Two forces are being applied to this bag of flour. Tension is pulling it upwards, and there's a scale reading how much tension, and weight is acting downward. That's the gravity force from the Earth. If the bag of flour doesn't move, that means that the weight and the tension force must be cancelling out. Okay? So when they add, they cancel to zero. So the net force on the flour is zero, and the bag of flour remains at rest. So su oops, support force. The normal force, or support force, is an upward force on an object that is opposite to the force of gravity. Example, you have a book sitting on a table. So there's a downward force of gravity on the book, that's the, the book's weight, and the book is sitting on the table so it's compressing it just a little bit. The framework of atoms in the table must be getting just a little squished. And I sometimes like to think of a trampoline. If you stand on a trampoline, it squishes down a little, a little bit. And wood is very stiff so it doesn't push down much, but it will a little. And, and the reaction to it being compressed is an upward support force or normal force. And when the book's at rest, then these uh, two forces, normal force and the gravity force, sum to zero. So another way of understanding this is if you push down on a spring, the spring pushes up on you. Similarly, the book pushes down on the table, the table pushes up on the book. So a, an object that is perfectly stationary has no net force on it. And that's called static equilibrium, like a hockey puck at rest on slippery ice. If the hockey puck is sliding at a constant speed in a straight line, this is also equilibrium because the net force must be zero. This is called dynamic equilibrium, meaning it's moving but not accelerating. So the test to see if something is in equilibrium is whether it's changing its velocity. So a crate sitting at rest is in static equilibrium. If it's pushed at a steady speed, so the velocity is not changing, that's dynamic equilibrium. It's also net force is zero. So here's a guy pushing this crate along at a constant velocity in a straight line. So his pushing force is equal to the friction force resisting motion, and it goes along at a steady speed. Now Copernicus came up with the idea that the Earth is orbiting the Sun. And so it's moving. And many people refuted this idea coming up with this example. If there's a tree with a bird sitting in it and a worm down below, and the tree is moving to the right very, very quickly because the Earth is orbiting the sun, then how could this bird dive down towards the worm and catch it without being kind of blown away or moved uh, by the motion of the tree? Well, this idea of inertia is that the tree, the worm, and the bird all have the same constant velocity due to their own inertia, which is causing them all to orbit the Earth. So relative to the tree and to the worm, the bird just has to aim for the worm, and he'll go along at just the right path as if he was, he was stationary. Okay, let's do chapter three on linear motion. Motion is relative. We're going to talk about velocity and acceleration and free fall. So first of all, velocity is always described as relative to something else. So here's the sun, here's the earth. You walk on a road relative to the earth, so you have some speed relative to the earth, 
but the earth is moving relative to the sun. So your motion relative to the sun is different than your motion relative to the earth. In this course, all the motion uh, will be relative to the earth unless otherwise stated. So speed is defined as the distance covered per the amount of travel time. The units in uh, SI units are meters per second. The equation here is speed is distance divided by time. Example, if a girl runs four meters in two seconds, her speed is two meters per second. Four divided by two is two. Average speed, okay, the entire distance covered divided by the total travel time. It doesn't indicate various instantaneous speeds along the way. So there's the equation for it. Example is, you drive a distance of 200 kilometers and it takes you two hours. That means your average speed was 100 kilometers per hour. But you may have stopped for gas or something and you may have gone, been speeding a little bit on the, on the freeway for part of it. So your instantaneous speed might have changed, but that's your average speed. Instantaneous speed is the speed at any instant. And that is what is read on the speedometer of your car. So you might speed up or slow down, but whatever it says in your speedometer at any instant is this, what we call the speed or instantaneous speed more precisely. So velocity is a description of the instantaneous speed and what direction it's moving. Velocity is a vector quantity. It has a magnitude, which the magnitude of the, of the velocity is called the speed, and it has a direction. So constant speed is steady speed. It's not speeding up, not slowing down. Constant velocity means two things, constant speed and constant direction, so a straight line path with no acceleration. So acceleration is a very precise concept in physics. It was formulated by Galileo when he was looking at these inclined planes. He noticed that balls going downwards have the speed steadily increasing, and balls going up a hill have the speed steadily decreasing. And he had this idea that they're not accelerating if it's going on no slope. So acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes over time. It's a tricky concept. It involves a change in speed or a change in direction, or it could be both. Example here is a car making a turn. Its velocity is not constant as it goes around in a circle, and therefore it's accelerating. In equation form, the acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the time interval. And the units are whatever your units of velocity are divided by your unit of time. Example, your car's speed right now is 40 kilometers per hour. Your car's speed five seconds later is 45 kilometers per hour. Your change in speed is 45 minus 40 is five kilometers per hour. And your acceleration is this five kilometers per hour per five seconds. So you divide five by five, you get one kilometers per hour per second. So when Galileo increased the inclination of his planes, he found that the balls roll down with greater accelerations. And when he got to a vertical incline, he got to some maximum acceleration, which is the same as if you just drop it with no incline at all. So when air resistance is negligible, all objects fell with the same unchanging acceleration. And that was called free fall. So objects falling only under the influence of gravity with no air resistance accelerate at the rate of 10 meters per second per second, i.e. that's the same as writing 10 meters per second squared. Or more precisely, you can call this 9.8 meters per second squared if you measure it here on Earth. So here's a ball. It's dropped off a very high cliff. And imagine if you had a little speedometer right beside the ball. Well, you'd see that this speedometer increased uh, a fixed amount every second. So maybe the velocity stopped at, started at rest if you dropped it. The, the equation is that the velocity will be the acceleration times the time if the acceleration is constant. So under free fall, the acceleration is constant, 10 meters per second squared. The speed after one second is 10 meters per second. After two seconds, it's 10 times two, it's 20 meters per second at this instant. After three seconds, 
It's accelerating 10 times 3 down here. It's 30 meters per second. It's going faster and faster. And so on. How far does it fall? The equation for that is d equals 1 half a times t times t, or 1 half a t squared. So under free fall, when you have acceleration of 10 meters per second squared, the distance after one second, 1 squared is 1, times 10 times a half gives you 5. It falls 5 meters after one second. Uh, after two seconds, 2 squared is 4, uh, times acceleration 10 meters per second squared is 40, divided by 2 is 20 meters. After 3 seconds, 3 squared is 9, times uh, 10 is 90, divided by uh, 2 is 45 meters. So I find, I find this interesting relation. After 1 second it goes 5 meters, after 20, 2 seconds it goes 20 meters, after 3 seconds it's gone 45 meters. So as it's speeding up, the distance between adjacent dots is getting greater and greater. 